Prairie Mosaic is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008, the North Dakota Council on the Arts, and by the members of Prairie Public. Welcome to Prairie Mosaic, a patchwork of stories about the arts, culture, and history in our region. Hi, I'm Barb Gravel. And I'm Matt O'Lean. On this edition of Prairie Mosaic, we'll explore Moorhead's famed Comstock House, visit a canoe camp in Minnesota's Northwest Angle, and hear the music of Rachel Iannero. With the right top down, got my right top down. Piper Fleck Bloomquist is a Scandinavian folk artist from Grand Forks. She studied many Swedish painting styles and has a passion for keeping the art form alive. My name is Piper Fleck Bloomquist. I'm a Scandinavian folk artist specializing in Swedish dolmaling, which is also called kerbets painting, and Swedish bunadsmaling. Dal molning. What is dal molning? Molning is the Swedish word for painting. Just like rose molling in Norwegian is rose painting. Molling or moller is um, Swedish word for paint or painting. Dal molning is folk art from Sweden that refers to the very big wall paintings, like painted wallpaper, that was done in Dalarna, Sweden. Specifically 1773 up until maybe the mid-1800s. Bunad's Molning describes the painting that was done roughly the same time period, although it started earlier and went on longer. It's a similar type of wall painting that was done in the southern part of Sweden. And the word Bunad is tapestry. This was also a time in the 18th century and 19th century of um, the church having kind of a lot of presence in the lives of people. And this is how those two painting styles are similar. The painters, both in southern Sweden, Bonads Molners, and the doll Mollers up in Dalarna, they had a, a Bible that had pictures of different stories, Old and New Testaments. They would use those pictures and paint those on the walls. So in northern Sweden, or the Dalarna painting, and there was always this big kerbets flower, and it is Swedish for gourd and it first appeared in one of the Swedish language Bibles. In southern Sweden, the Bunads Molars, they used those same stories but that big kerbets flower is not present. They told them not in one giant picture but almost like a comic strip, scene after scene after scene. And it could be either left to right or right to left depending on where the head of house was going to be seated. I've dived quite heavily into the history of, of this particular art form in Sweden and how it evolved and why it's so unique to these two areas of Sweden. And here's another thing. Why am I interested in this? The chemistry of pigments and the history of pigment use is fascinating to me. And these artists had access to a lot of interesting pigments. A lot of them, they made their own paints. I can make my own paints. I know how. I'm much more comfortable using acrylic paint. When I paint, I try to be faithful to the way they did it originally sometimes, not all the time. I just can't go too far. There, there's a point where if you go too far, then suddenly you're not, you're not following this anymore. Then you're not part of um, this tradition anymore. My favorite paintings that I've done that I had had in my mind for many years has been brewing in the back of my heart, always there, always there. How am I going to do this? I wanted to do a piece on my hometown, a very small town in Minnesota, population 44. A lot of the things that we did in that town 
are universal truths for other people who have lived in small towns in rural upper Midwest. One of the things that the Bunaz Maulers and the Dalla Maulers both did was there was script across the top describing the story. And sometimes there was script in the painting itself. So if there was an activity happening down in one corner, the artist might put a couple of words above that activity describing it. And my dad owned one of the two bars and one of the things he and many of the bar owners in our area had was this Ham's beer sign above the cash register that was moving. And all of us loved to watch that moving beer sign. It was mesmerizing as a child and it's still mesmerizing to this day in my mind. So I had to include that little tiny picture of the Ham's beer sign above my dad's bar but you wouldn't notice it if it weren't for the fact that I ended the script with, oh, how I wanted to live in that enchanted little tent. I'm not a production artist. That being said, if I've already gone through that process and have come up with something and sketched it, I can repeat that over and over and over again. That's what the old painters did. They had their pre-designed, pre-conceived ideas. Here you go, farm wife, pick out which one you want. That one, got it, I'll work on that right now. And there, I don't know that there was a lot of thought process. For me, there is definitely, and my best work is work that I do for me. Because when I paint, honestly, it's coming from here. It is, it's me having to come out. The Comstock House is Moorhead's oldest standing house. Now an historic monument, the house is a combination of warmth and formality. The 1882 structure gives visitors a sense of what life was like in those times. It's kind of an odd combination of warmth and formality that I think is typical of the late 19th century. It's a beautiful location, it's a beautiful spot, nice and quiet. This house is an 1882-1883 Queen Anne stick style Victorian that was built by Solomon Comstock. Solomon Comstock was a very influential member of the Moorhead community. Well, it's one of the most impressive houses in town. It's one of the few houses from the early 1880s, from a very critical time, the development of the city of Moorhead. Comstock, of course, very critical to the development as well. Solomon Comstock was working as like a mid-level law clerk in the district attorney's office in Minneapolis. And he didn't really see a lot of opportunity for advancement. It was a case of too many lawyers and not enough positions. And so Solomon actually did manual labor for the railroad, the Northern Pacific Railroad, to get a free ride up here into Moorhead. And so he laid track for the railroad. When he arrived here in Moorhead, basically he was stuck because the railroad ended and he had no money to go anywhere else. He was actually in the right place, right time sort of a thing. There was a saloon shooting between two individuals, Lim Jim Shumway and Stanley Chang Stanton, and an innocent bystander was killed. And at that time there was no sheriff, there wasn't really a law presence out here. And so the people of Moorhead were like, this is getting out of hand. And so they appointed somebody, the first sheriff. Solomon Comstock was just in the right place, right time with the only person they knew with a law degree. And so that is how he became the first Clay County attorney. 1882 was a critical year for Moorhead and for Comstock. Both 1881 and 1882 were flood years, pretty bad floods. And Comstock's original house was located over on 2nd Street North, just in front of what's now the Emcom Center in Moorhead. So he had a front row seat to those floods. I think that probably drove him for building this house on this spot right here. Solomon Comstock had the great fortune of being a smart man, and so he knew land is really where he was going to make his money back, especially as more people were moving to the Plains area. He bought and sold land, and he owned quite a bit of the land here in Moorhead. He obviously didn't need that land, he wasn't farming it, and so he would sell it to different people, but he also donated the land to Bishop Whipple, which became Concordia, and to the Moorhead Normal School, which would become MSUM. This house was occupied by the family for about 80 years, so it was built in 1883 is when they became occupants of it. And George Comstock donated it to the Minnesota Historical Society shortly before he died in 1965. 
And from the 1880s up until the 1965s, one member of the family lived here continuously. Now they had other homes in Moorhead. George's family lived in a different home, but they did move into this home eventually after his sister Jessie had passed away. So in the 1970s, the house was undergoing renovations. There was a group formed called the Friends of Comstock, but the city actually ran the house. They were the ones who maintained it. Um, they had offices in here to give tours and just upkeep it. It was given to the Historical and Cultural Society of Clay County just a few years ago, actually, because you're so far away from the cities. And so managing this is hard for the Minnesota Historical Society, and so they kind of outsourced it. Minnesota Historical Society came in and brought it back to its Victorian roots. So it was no longer a Victorian home that had been updated in the 50s, it was back to its Victorian 1880s presence. And so they chose period appropriate wallpapers and carpet to fill in the gaps that existed in the house. But luckily, because the family had lived here a long time, we do have a lot of their original fixtures and furnishings and personal items. So it does really give the house a little something extra. What we do to maintain the home is we monitor settlement of the house, we do bug checks, we have radiator checks daily during the winter time to make sure our boiler is running properly. We deep clean it twice a year, spot clean it throughout the year otherwise. And so it's really a labor of love though because we love this house and we want it to shine for the community. Almost all, the whole house is open to the public, so we do show them obviously our main floor which has a little bit of the grander features, but I think the real meaty stuff comes when you get up into the bedrooms. These are where their private lives, these are where they could be themselves. Ada Comstock could read and write by the time she was five, which really isn't unusual because her mother had been a school teacher. And she graduated high school at the age of 15, and then she would eventually graduate from Smith College. And she went into education and eventually she got her doctorate from Columbia. She just had a really long, very fulfilled life. She starts off by being the first Dean of Women at the University of Minnesota, and then she becomes the first president of Radcliffe College, which is a sister school of Harvard. And she served on something called the Wickersham Commission, which was personally asked by President Hoover to be on this commission. And she was the only woman on the commission. We actually didn't know a lot about Jessie Comstock. She had apparently written her life story and nobody would publish it so she threw it in a fire. But a group of Concordia students set out to find out what they could about her and so they did a lot of extensive research and found out that she was just as educated as her sister and in fact she was one of the first in the family to go abroad. She studied abroad at Oxford University. George was the only boy. He was educated at Harvard and he also served in World War I. But George pretty much stuck close to home after that. He did work in a bank for a while, but eventually he went into real estate like his father. He did marry a woman named Frances Frazier, and they had one daughter named Susan Comstock. Our Christmas tours are definitely very popular. I've always loved old houses. I think there's just that nostalgic feeling people like when they get to walk into old Victorian houses. But as I unfolded and learned more about this family and learned more about these women who were defying traditional Victorian norms and Solomon who poured his heart and soul back into Moorhead. He wasn't from here, but he loved this community and he tried everything he could to improve it. And Sarah also, she's the reason we have a public library in Moorhead. They were real people, but they also did extraordinary things, and I think it says a lot about the human spirit, and I think that's something that everybody can connect to. Lake Trails Base Camp has been hosting wilderness camping and canoeing adventures for teenagers since 1952. Located on beautiful Oak Island in Lake of the Woods, the heart of this experience lies within building friendships that last a lifetime. We are at Lake Trails Base Camp, located on the very southern tip of Oak Island. Technically, we're called Oak Point. My name is Sue Lem, and I'm the camp director. Uh, have been for the past 10 years now. Everybody looking good? Yeah! Lake Trails began in 1952. It was a vision of Father Bill Merkins. He wanted to start a camp for teenagers where they could go and explore the wilderness and you know just really have fun and, and of course because of his love of boats that was always part of the vision as well. They got permission from the Diocese of Crookston to start a camp. 
And so Father Bill and Father Jerry rented a boat and they started going around to all the little islands, just exploring. But they decided that this was a pretty good spot and they started doing really very similar to what we're doing today. They went out on canoe trips and just started exploring the area. In the very beginning, it was a Catholic boys camp. After a couple years, they started thinking about why should the boys have all the fun? So a girls camp was started. And in the 70s, the decision was made to just go co-ed. The current mission of Lake Trails it's built off of Father Bill's vision of what he called the Lake Trails idea. We want kids to learn really to appreciate themselves, to appreciate nature, to become a positive member of their community. I can remember Father Bill many times using the phrase unconditional acceptance. And that was just drilled into us th through his sermons and just in his everyday life. Forgive readily and be part of the community that we're building. Have a wilderness adventure. That was all part of the Lake Trails idea. Watch over us as our five days on trail help us bond, create memories, and hopefully bring us back a little bit more in touch with nature. It's a pretty intense nine days, but the, the real magic, the real heart of it all happens when they're out on trail. And so the first day is mostly getting here get them out to the island and they check in. You check in your phone and you check in your electronics. We don't want them to be staring at a screen. We want them to interact with one another. And that's how real friendships are formed, really. It's just through human face-to-face -face contact. And they have a big supper that night, big campfire that kind of sets the stage for the week. There's a lot of crazy skits and just the guides are amazing there funny and imaginative and creative and they really start out on a, a fun note. The second day is kind of a crash course in everything we want them to learn on their canoe trip. So we teach them everything from how to set up a tent to how to paddle to how to poop in the woods. <laughs> That's some kids have to know. They spend the rest of that day just packing their gear, deciding what their menu is gonna be for the week. And at some point during the day, the group will go paddling and really get that experience of being on the water and pushing the water around with your paddle. The real heart of the program starts on day three. That's when you start to see, I start to see kind of some nervousness sometimes, um, some excitement, a little apprehension once in a while, especially for kids that have never been here before. They're not necessarily sure what they've gotten themselves into, <laughs> which I think is great. You know, a little uncertainty is, is good for a person sometimes. And again, I think this is a little unusual that Lake Trails allows campers to choose their own canoe trips. That was one of the things early on that Father Bill wanted to have happened. So we, we still today try to have the kids very involved with the planning of the canoe trip. I know a lot of camps it goes by age or by your grade in school and we don't really care about that. From the moment they leave the beach we just call it trail magic or the lake trails magic and it's just amazing what happens when they're out on trail. My very favorite part is watching them leave and then fast forward five days and watching them return and the transformation is amazing. Be good to each other, work as a team. And the, the real magic is that that whole time, this lovely community is forming. You know, they learn about each other and they, they, they make new friends. They learn about kids who come from different circumstances than their own. Every trip has at least two guides and they're traveling from island to island. They learn how to start fires. They learn how to do a little cooking over the campfire. They learn how to set up tents. They learn that they're way more capable than they probably gave themselves credit for. Then they come back from trail and oh my gosh, the celebration is just crazy. And the stories begin immediately when they get out of the canoes. There will be a lot of tears at the end of the summer when we all go our separate ways because you, you just get so close. This is the best kept secret in Minnesota. People just don't know about us. And that has always been a challenge is to let people know because there's 
truly life-changing things that are happening here for the better and people don't know that we even exist. Rachel Iannero of Detroit Lakes is a fresh talent who brings a sense of love, optimism, and fun to her original tunes. Her stage presence and performance level are impressive to behold. You said I met her in the fall, standing on a corner street. Acoustics rang from a coffee shop, and the leaves were changing colors that we. She said her name was Mary Jane and she was only in town for a couple more days But that was all the time it took to fall like a drop of rain
If you know of an artist, a topic, or an organization in our region that you think might make for an interesting segment, please contact us at Prairie Mosaic at prairiepublic.org. You can watch this and other episodes of Prairie Mosaic on Prairie Public's YouTube channel and follow Prairie Public on social media as well. I'm Matt Olin. And I'm Barb Gravel. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Prairie Mosaic. Prairie Mosaic is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008, the North Dakota Council on the Arts, and by the members of Prairie Public.